Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Woodrick. I'm the Domestic Policy Director here at the McDonald Laurie Institute. Very pleased that you could join us today for this podcast slash vodcast. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today by MLI Senior Fellow Patrice Dutille, who's also a professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration at Toronto Metropolitan University, or as I like to call it, the university formerly known as Ryerson. Uh, I'm going to be speaking with Patrice today about the new book he's put together entitled Statesmen, Strategists and Diplomats, Canada's Prime Ministers in the Making of Foreign Policy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrice. It's a pleasure to be with you, Aaron. Thank you. So I guess I always start with the obvious question whenever I'm talking with an author or editor of a book yes. is why, why this volume? Why did you want to put a book together about prime ministers and foreign policy? Well, for me, I'm going to give you it's a classic question. I'm going to give you a classic answer. It's a book I wanted to read. It's a book that I needed to have on my shelf, and it wasn't there. Um, so, and, and the other thing is that I, I'm an old man in a hurry. I mean, I could have written this book myself, but I don't have three years, uh, three to four years to write this. I have I have a whole bunch of other projects on my on you my. You did table. write a few chapters. Don't sell yourself short. Well, I did, and I always do, and I think it's important for people who put edit who put together edited books to actually make a contribution. I think that's very important, but. I didn't have the time to spend three or four years on this. And luckily, I, I, I have friends. I have friends in, in, in history and in political science and public administration who were very kind and generous with their time and who had the expertise I was looking for to contribute a volume that would look at each and every prime minister and examine them in terms of their foreign policy. Incredibly, there is no such volume. There have been volumes in the past uh, that would look at, uh, I'm thinking, uh, for example, of, of a wonderful book um, on, on prime ministers and presidents um, by, by the journalist, uh, the Globe Mail journalist, whose name escapes me right now, and that's terribly, and it's unforgiving. Um, but it's a very good book, but it stops, it basically stops with, with Mulroney, as I recall. I wanted to go back to John A. MacDonald uh, and, and to go all the way up to Justin Trudeau. Now, this book was, was conceived in 2019, and so the thought there was that, you know, there's only a few years for Trudeau. Um, but, you know, here we are in 2023, and it's been a few years. Anyway, the, the, the chapter on Trudeau is a little more fulsome than I had, I had anticipated. But again, to answer your question, this book did not exist. I needed to have this on my shelf. I wanted a book that would systematically look at every prime minister uh, in terms of their foreign policy, in terms of their agency, in terms of their role. And, um, you know, here it is. It's, uh, it's, it's done. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to the contributors. And I'm very proud of the, of the work they did. Well, and it's a great answer is that you write a book because it's something you yourself would want to read. But perhaps yes. it's more surprising that a book like this didn't exist. I mean, you think that it's a rather large topic. Um, you know, uh, Canada has a significant history in this and there was nothing there. I guess the next question, though, because this is not a book about foreign policy per se. It's a book about the, how prime ministers impact foreign policy. And I guess an obvious question a lot of people would have is, uh, you know, don't we have a minister for this? We have a minister of foreign affairs. They're the one in charge of the portfolio. So how come prime ministers and not uh, foreign ministers as a subject matter for book? Well, and, and, and it's a very good, it's, it's again, an excellent question. We've had a minister of external relations or a secretary of state for external relations, as they were known officially, uh, since 1946, when Louis Saint Laurent was asked by Mackenzie King to take over. Before that, the prime minister assumed that role, either mm. formally or informally. John A. Macdonald, in addition to everything that he did, was also the de facto minister of external relations for Canada throughout his, his, his governance. Wilfrid Laurier, same thing. Robert Borden, same thing. By the way, Laurier and Borden did appoint a, a secretary of state for external relations uh, for a few months uh, both of them for a few months, and they realized that these guys were were entirely useless uh, because the real decisions in foreign policy were being made by the prime minister in the prime minister's office. And it has been so ever since. Mm -hmm. There, If there's one line of continuity between John A. Macdonald and Justin Trudeau, it is that the office of the prime minister, the prime minister himself, I'm using himself because there's only been one mm -hmm. female prime minister and she wasn't there very long, Kim Campbell. Uh, but the, 
the prime minister has been central to the decision making. The important decisions on Canada's foreign relations take place in the prime minister's office. It was like that in McDonald's day. It's like that today. And it's important, therefore, to understand that personal uh, perspective on foreign policy. How did those prime ministers translate their views, their prejudice, their, their hunches, their interests into that field uh, in which they have remarkable independence? It's not like foreign, it's not like domestic policy. Domestic policy, there's all sorts of interests. There's all sorts of contests for views. Ministers have expertise. In foreign policy, that expertise is greatly diminished. Very few Canadians have any expertise in foreign policy. I mean, unless you're working in it, why would you? Why would you? Whereas if you're in banking or, you know, you're, you're in touch with bank, I'm just using an example. I mean, you know, we all have sure. contacts with banks. We're not experts in banking, but we all have experience. What experience do you have in foreign policy? You'd have none. So Canadian prime ministers basically have the feel to themselves, have as a result, tremendous latitude and uh, can really express their personalities, their, their instincts and in policymaking uh, in that field. There are constraints, of course, there are constraints, but, and there are competing pressures. I'm not diminishing that, but there's no doubt that in Canadian foreign policy, the prime minister is the agent that is the most decisive. And that person will either green light initiatives or red light initiatives. They will, they will move on things or they will block things. And that's, that's important to understand. Yeah, this is interesting. You said 1946, the first time we have a minister. So really, a lot of Canadians may not realize for almost the first half of our history as a country, the prime minister was in effect, uh, you know, because there was no foreign minister, they were they were acting in that capacity. But you're also saying ever since, even though we have a foreign minister, in reality, because they are appointed by the prime minister, and that, of course, for, you know, people think of large sort of global events that are attended by the prime minister uh, in, in almost all cases. So even though we have a foreign minister, the ultimate decision maker remains the prime minister. Obviously. I think it, you're raising a great topic here in terms of international symmetry. Um, you know, for the last, I mean, we've always had summits. John A. Macdonald attended a few summits in his uh, 20 years in power. Laurier was a regular attendee at the imperial conferences uh, that took place uh, in London. Um, but since the 19, late 1970s, since the, let's, let's say the advent of the G6, 1976, 75, 76, prime ministers, the prime ministers are on a regular schedule of yeah. Of, of international events. Uh, again, there will be events with foreign uh, ministers. There are parallel events with public servants. I'm not diminishing that, but where th it matters, where the tone is set, where the direction is cast is when the prime minister is involved. Now, I always remember uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper telling a journalist uh, after four years, five years in power, how shocked he was yeah. at the amount of time foreign policy uh, took uh, out of his schedule. And, yeah. you know, th again, he, that he was surprised was surprising to me. I think for people who watch Canadian foreign policy, uh, that would be surprising also because Canadian prime ministers have always been there. And there's another point that you raise. I think that's an important one here. And that's the fact that especially over the last 25 years since Mr. Chrétien, um, our foreign ministers don't stay in the job very long. Mm. Um, I, somebody, it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming an issue. A few people have spoken about this uh, over the last year, uh, but the average tenure of a foreign policy, of a foreign minister in Canada over the last 25 years has been two years. Two years is absolutely nothing. The, all you know, of them. get your feet wet in two years. Well, yeah. You can't. And, and none of them, none of them, with perhaps the exception of Lloyd uh, Axworthy, uh, had any foreign policy experience. None of them do. So they are literally thrust into the spotlight. They have no idea of what they're doing. They have no contacts. Uh, they have to learn the job on the, on the fly. They have to absorb phenomenal amounts of, of data and briefings mm -hmm. and all that stuff. It takes, yeah, it, it takes at least a year, I'd say a lot longer, but at least a year to get to know your way around the Pearson building. That's mm -hmm. number one. And then 
and then you know you're, you're starting to you're starting to 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 break out and to form some sort of contacts with your your colleagues internationally that sure. that currency well that currency that familiarity mm. that is essential to diplomacy gets developed those first awkward moves you know the oh yeah. nice to meet you uh, they, you know here's a picture of the family this is what i do these yeah, are the yeah. constraints well, and then you're gone. <laughs> then you yeah. start again. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 very difficult on the bureaucracy because they're always in the first stages of briefing. Anyway, it does not it does not lead to good policy, and inevitably, of course, the continuity is provided by the prime minister. The point right. is that this has reinforced the prime minister's role. Uh, nobody would dispute today that uh, Justin Trudeau is the person who sets foreign policy for Canada, as his predecessor did, and I would argue just the way, the same way that John A. Macdonald did. Uh, there have been a few exceptional foreign policy ministers, foreign ministers. I'm thinking of Louis Saint Laurent, for example, 1946, until he became prime minister uh, in 1948. Louis Saint Laurent was an exceptional uh, minister of foreign affairs. And not surprisingly, based on that, uh, Mackenzie King chose him to be his successor. Uh, Saint Laurent's successor, uh, Lester Pearson was chosen by Saint Laurent to become the Minister of External Relations, the Secretary of State for External Relations. Uh, and of course, Pearson had been the Deputy Minister and mm -hmm. lived all his life in external. Uh, he was an exceptional Minister of, uh, of External Relations. But after that, really, uh, I, I mentioned uh, Lloyd Axworthy. Uh, Matthew Hayday, who wrote a wonderful chapter uh, on the uh, foreign policy of Brian Mulroney, gives tremendous credit to Joe Clark. Uh, Joe Clark, who was an exceptional minister of foreign relations, working in symbiosis with um, with uh, Brian Mulroney. Former really, rival. A former rival, absolutely. Absolutely. A former rival, but who really worked together mm -hmm. to... to um, to bring Canada's presence to bear on foreign affairs, to strike out in interesting new directions, to make an impact. Um, that kind of duo we have not seen in 40 years now. And it's a mm. terrible thing. As I've argued in a piece for MLI uh, that was posted earlier this month, uh, we're, we're in serious, pro serious problems in Canada in terms of the visibility of our, of our diplomacy. Uh, we're just not there. And uh, I know a lot of people are talking about, the minister has talked about a revamping of foreign policy, a revamping of the Department of Global Affairs. Uh, this is urgently needed now because we're in a direction that is certainly not serving Canadian interests. So anyway, right. the idea of a book like this is to cast it, to cast it in a historical perspective, to say, to bring out some of the, the, the similarities between good old John A. Macdonald and and uh, Mackenzie King and Louis Saint Laurent and Pierre Trudeau and Justin Trudeau and everybody in between, because there are a lot of continuities, but there are also uh, a lot of differences. And speaking of those differences, you know, you, you throughout the book, you break down the impact that prime ministers have on foreign policy. You have three broad areas that you lay out. You call them structure, policy, and style. So maybe you can sort of explain the, the rationale for those categories and give a few examples of those. Well, this is something uh, that I developed. Uh, I've been developing over for over a decade now. Um, and I, I've been working on the office of the prime minister, the prime minister's generally for for over a dozen years it started with my book on on johnny mcdonald again an edited book bringing together 15 odd contributors from all all aspects of of, of uh, humanities and social science uh to bring them together on on a particular topic to try to better understand <clears throat> deepen our understanding of a, of a prime minister and so the, the the question for me um has been how do we understand a prime minister how do we measure the effectiveness of a prime minister if you read the literature um if you, if you the various biographies of prime ministers the few studies that we have inevitably the author has harvested anecdotes oh he did this he did that he did this he met with this person he did this he made this decision okay fine anecdotes are fun they're fun to read they're enlightening in many cases, they're enlightening. If the if the anecdotes were well chosen, it's enlightening. But what is missing here? Too often, the other aspects of of decision making are missing. So uh, my my thought was this: 
foreign policy is defined foreign policy and i, I would i would say other aspects mm -hmm. of policy are, are, are follow the same pattern a prime minister can have enormous impact uniquely uniquely forceful impact in shaping the structures because the prime minister has enormous power in this country to appoint enormous power in determining budget in determining how a department will be formed divided uh, fused whatever a prime minister has enormous impact in structuring mm -hmm. foreign policy in providing the structures of foreign policy so i'll give you an example um it's often forgotten that Mackenzie King, when he was returned to power in 1935, immediately boosted the defense budget of the government of Canada. Now, R.B. Bennett had started with the, uh, when, when Hitler uh, attained power in 1933, immediately R.B. Bennett raised the military budget. Not very much, though, but he did. At least he, he turned the corner. Canada's expenditures uh, through the 20s and early 30s had been uh, precipitously uh, dropping in terms of the military. R.B. Bennett instantly responded to Hitler's uh, um, arrival to power. Mackenzie King comes in and boosts it considerably, considerably, and will continue to boost it through the 1930s. He knows, Mackenzie King knows that there's something bad that's mm -hmm. going to happen. He'll visit Hitler in 1930 seven uh and we've there's been books written about this and it's it's all very intriguing but there's no disputing the fact that Mackenzie king knew that something bad was going to happen here at the same time Mackenzie king is also through the 1920s shaping the department of external relations appointing people i'm thinking obviously of oscar skelton uh been many many works about him uh you know shaping foreign policy bringing in expertise that is structural those mm -hmm. are structural decisions that have made an enormous impact conversely jean chrétien in the 1990s slashed the military slashed canada's ability to perform peacekeeping operations slashed the canadian diplomacy i would argue and i think a lot of people would agree that we have not recovered from those dramatic cuts to the international apparatus of canada's bureaucracy we're still mm -hmm. suffering the consequences of that those are structural decisions they're mm -hmm. they're deep below the surface there are policy decisions and those you know and that in terms of policy we 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 have a good understanding of mm -hmm. the evolution of canada's foreign policy i'm not going to dwell on that a whole lot sure. but i do want to make a division between foreign policy and diplomacy and this is the diplomacy that is exercised by the prime minister himself how does this person behave internationally uh, again there are varieties of style we have people like John A. Macdonald or Wilfrid Laurier, Wilfrid Laurier, who was a superstar in mm -hmm. his day. I mean, people loved meeting Sir Wilfrid, whether it was in London or, or in, in Paris. Uh, he was exotic, an exotic bird. He spoke well. He was charming. He was friendly. He was remarkable. Robert Borden's a very different bird. Uh, Mackenzie King, uh, a thoughtful man, uh, a respectful man, was uh, well recognized in the capitals in, in London and Washington. Um, to what degree is still an open question, but there's no doubt that Mackenzie King was respected in international capitals. Louis Saint Laurent makes a decision to uh, undertake a world tour in 1954. You know, he winds up in uh, Islamabad, he, he winds up in New Delhi, he goes to Tokyo. Uh, of course, he visits. Germany and France and London, you know, he's a big hit. He's a big hit. Pierre Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau's personal diplomacy was remarkably impactful. But I draw the distinction between that personal radiance and foreign policy. I think that they cannot mm -hmm. be uh, confused. And yeah. if we draw the distinction between them, I think you get a better appreciation for uh, how foreign policy is actually exercised by the prime minister, how it's shaped. So thinking of structures and policy and, and diplomacy, personal diplomacy are useful tools to mm -hmm. better appreciate how an individual shapes uh, Canadian foreign policy. 
No, absolutely. And so, uh, and obviously, uh, as part of the book, the volume, you've surveyed all the contributors on these yes. measures uh, to come up with some rankings uh, of the best and the worst. And I don't want to give, uh, I don't want to give the game away. I want to encourage people to read the book, but at the risk of some spoilers, maybe you can give us yes. a bit of a hint about who fares well on these measures and who does not fare quite well, as well. You know, this is, a, I, I took a, I took a chance on this and, um, I, I thought it would be something that would be a lot of fun. You know, while I was editing the papers that were coming in, uh, I ran across, uh, again, because, you know, this is the stuff you read, I ran across the various surveys that were done by Jack Branstein and Norman Helmer and Stephen Atze uh, about ranking Canadian prime ministers. You know, they go back to the late 1990s. There have been three of them. I think there's a fourth one that's going to happen fairly soon. And they're a lot of fun. They're fun. All right. They're fun. It's important to understand and underscore that they're fun. They're just fun. It's very hard to evaluate and to compare sure. prime ministers. But I said, said to myself, here I've got, you know, 15 people who really know Canadian foreign policy, who really know, have an appreciation for the evolution. Um, what if I asked them uh, to do a little survey? You know, again, it's not a scientific thing in the sense that I've got 200 experts, but I've got 15 people who are really expert. Why not take advantage of that? So I asked my colleague, Andrea Migone, to help me craft uh, a survey. And I asked, I asked something like 15 questions. So it's very detailed. And the chapter, you're not, we're not going to give anything away. The chapter gives a lot of detail about how these 15 people interpreted the various prime ministers. But I can give you this. And it's not, I mean, and it's the important question, the important answer you're looking for, Eric. Who came out the number one? Well, we're asking people, you know, to evaluate prime ministers in terms of their structural contribution, their policy contribution, their personal diplomatic contribution. And it was a really tight race, a really tight race between Mackenzie King and Louis Saint Laurent. And Louis Saint Laurent took it by a nose. <laughs> it was that it was that tight a race between them. Why? Because this was, I mean, again, in a way, it's not surprising. Canada coming out of the Second World War was a world strength militarily, uh, shaping NATO, uh, shaping the structures of foreign policy in 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 uh, in Canada, creating NORAD. Louis Saint Laurent uh, getting involved in international assistance. He's the one who will launch uh, official international assistance, over, um, participating in the Colombo Plan in 1950, the, the, the peace uh, initiative, the Pearson Peace Initiative. Let's not forget that Louis Saint Laurent was a prime minister at that time. There's no way this peace initiative would have happened without Saint Laurent's approval. Um, Saint Laurent wins by a nose because of these extra things he did. Mm -hmm. Uh, Canada really was shining around the globe at that time. There was a real effort made to bring together the structural strengths of, of the policy apparatus, the military apparatus, combined with imaginative foreign policy that was military, diplomatic uh, assistance, you name it, active on the peace front in a manner that's just not been replicated. Uh, at the other end, at the other end, you're not going to be surprised that, you know, John Diefenbaker does not rank very well. And, you know, that's been that's been the case basically since he left office in 1963. I mean, John Diefenbaker was very badly harmed by the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, by Canada's response uh, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Liberals never let him forget it. Uh, and his reputation has been deeply uh, marked by that. Uh, I have to say, uh, Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau also rank at the bottom um, because there's a perception among the 15 of us that Canada's foreign policy has declined significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, its effectiveness has declined significantly over the last over the last 15 years, both in terms of the structures, in terms of the policy, and in terms of the diplomacy exercised by Mr. Harper and Mr. Trudeau. So there's a perception there. Maybe that'll change. Of course, they'll change as time goes on, just like the, the general prime ministerial rankings have changed over the last 25 years. That'll change. But I thought it'd be a good place to start. And I have to say, uh, I think that for students, because uh, I teach Canadian foreign policy at the Toronto Metropolitan University, and it's a question that inevitably comes up at the end of the course, who was most 
who is most effective. And of course, we have great debates about this, and we're always discussing context and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, here's a more studied approach. And really, the challenge is, you know, do you agree as a reader? Do you agree with these assessments or not? I think it's a great way to finish off a book. Anyway, I hope I hope people like it. As I said, I'm not, I, I've given away the winners and the losers. But in this chapter, there's in this chapter, there is all sorts of subtleties about who did a better job in terms of structures, who did a better job in terms of policy, who did a better job in terms of personal diplomacy. And, you know, uh, I think it's well worth the read for that. The analysis is fine. And um, it's it's a provocative way. It's a provocative approach. And it's a provocative way of, of finishing off a book like this. I thought anyway. I thought. I thought it was great. Uh, we're getting all the contributors to to put their two cents in. I think it's an outstanding book. The book is Statesmen, Strategists, and Diplomats, Canada's Prime Ministers and the Making of Foreign Policy, edited by Patrice Dutil. You can find it at UBC Press, Indigo, and uh, a number of other on online retailers. And for anyone with any interest in Canadian history, I encourage you to definitely check this book out. Uh, I want to thank you, Patrice, very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you to our viewers and listeners, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, Aaron. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.